Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you had a, a good two days. It's the last session of the conference now, but one of the, the most popular sessions uh, to have a chance to have final discussions, to talk about some of the things we never had a chance to talk about over the last two days, or to uh, have another chance to cover some of the things or rediscuss some of the topics that we, we talked about. But I hope that you did have a good two days and that you uh, picked up some new information, met some new people, made some new contacts. Uh, and this is the, the finale, the final chance to ask some questions to, the, to this great panel. Uh, and what, what, what makes this such a good opportunity is the level and the quality that we've been very lucky to have in the, in the final panel. Uh, from the far side, someone who is new uh, to this year's conference. I think most of you will know him. He is one of the most important people in automotive logistics in China, Mr. Xu Guangqing, who's uh, from Saic General Motors. Uh, next to uh, Mr. Xu is Balakrishnan Adi, the Deputy Director of Material Planning and Logistics from Chang'an Ford. And next to him, uh, Greg Tournman, the Global Director of Material Logistics and Freight for AGCO. Uh, and the young gentleman sitting directly next to me, Mr. Ma Zengrong, uh, from, uh, from Vice President of Kala from CFLP. Thank you, Mr. Ma. So this is the panel, and again, this is, it's, it's Q&A, it's questions and discussions, there are no presentations, and it's a great opportunity for you to ask some of these people some questions. You can make some comments if you have something that you... Uh, that you want to say, something that you disagreed with on the, over the last two days, or if you ju ha just have direct questions to one member of the panel or to all members of the panel, this is a great opportunity uh, to ask the question. One of the questions I get asked when I travel around the world meeting people, they say, how can we get a chance to talk to people like this? Well, this is your, this is your opportunity. Uh, but because I have the microphone, I have the luck to be able to ask the first question. And I'm going to start from Mr. Shu's side, although I'm going to be using a quote from, uh, from Greg Tournman in the last session from AGCO. He said, uh, instead of optimizing what we have today, we need to look at where we want to be in the future. So my, my question first to Mr. Shu is, do you have a chance to look at where you want to be in the future? Are you so busy fixing today's problems and yesterday's problems? How do you have a, plan, a chance to think of where you want your logistics organization to be in four or five years' time? So, Mr. Xu. Uh, thank you very much. It's a, it's a very good question that has been in my mind for many years. In the automotive in logistics industry, I've been working for over 20 years. I, my work should no longer be focusing on the day-to-day -day work because I have a very good team. The SAIC General Motor has a very good team, and uh, the, the logistics supplier is Angie. Um, they have already solved most of the day-to-day -day operation issues. So most of the things that I'm thinking about right now is are, are about the company itself, also the industry itself, and what are the changes facing them in the future. Also, I strive to make some changes. Two years ago, I participated, or two to three years ago, I participated in the conference. I played a video to all of you showing some of my ideas and concepts. I'm very glad to see that some of the ideas have already materialized in the logistic ch value chain of Saic General Motor and has been promoted and adapted. Some of the things in the video were automation. Besides the hardware side, we are also making progress in digitalization and improvement. 
So uh, whether it's um, automation or digitalization, a, a, the aim is to help reduce cost. Yeah. I think, uh, as Mr. Shu said, this is a great opportunity for all the automotive OEMs, suppliers, and logistics service providers, especially as a newcomer to China, uh, four months old here, I see the team is great. Um, the team under me, they are working very well, day-to-day -day problem, they are solving issues, etc. Thinking the future, I think how we can all unite and bring the change, the ideas, and, and the implementation aspects. I will just pick one example. I think that may help to reach. We see clearly data is the revenue. There are a lot of data, be it big data, data analytics, and digitalization, all that we are seeing. In future, I see data is going to help a quick decision making. And I mentioned in my previous session as well how we see reports and how we turn the reports from descriptive and from descriptive to predictive and from predictive to prescriptive. So that's the, from the data, what we should do in future and how quick we can do. I think that's the great opportunity. And if we can use this in our logistics business, be it import or be it export, I think that will really help a win-win situation because no consumer pays money for logistics. The consumer pays for the product. So how we can reach our goods and services which helps consumer and how to reduce the cost. I think that's where I see future. Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you. I'm going to skip you for a minute, Greg. Uh, Mr. Ma, uh, do you think that the, the car makers, maybe in particular and part suppliers, China is leading the way in many new developments in electric vehicles, perhaps almost uh, also for autonomous cars. You have great technology. Do you see that the automotive logistics industry is looking ahead, taking advantage of the technology, preparing to be logistics part, uh, logistics organizations to support the industry in five years' time? Or do you think they are still trying to fix today's problems? OK. This is a very uh, cutting edge issue. I think it's a very hot topic right now as well, and has been talked about frequently, brought up frequently by the experts in this conference, whether it's the development, whether a uh, new energy cars or smart telematics. Maybe China is ahead and more focused than the rest of the countries because China tries to overtake the developed uh, countries by sh um, uh, by getting a shortcut. So over the uh, last dec a few decades of development, China would like to grasp the mo most promising technologies so that the government, the industry can really come up with um, um, pragmatic and uh, uh, practice, practical policies to help to fuel the growth. Chinese experts are working very hard to help China to lead in this regard. I can't say for sure that the technology can be adopted in automotive logistics in the next five years. However, definitely the automotive logistics can be the leader in the entire logistic industry in China. Lo automotive logistics has always been at the forefront. Even though automotive logistics are uh, behind, lagged behind the rest of the w international counterparts, but it's catching up fast. For example, the Changjiu Logistics and Anji Logistics. 
and also we can see the development in the railway uh, with the, under the scheme of a Belt and Road. They are going abroad as well. So I believe that in the future, automotive logistics will step up in the application of the new technologies. Whether it can be re materialized in five years or not, um, I can't say, but Rome is not built in one day, so we improve day by day. And then back to you, Greg, from Agco. It was your quote. Uh, that's what you did, and that's how you uh, re-energized or redeveloped the Agco logistics and supply chain. So I'm interested in the processes you went to went through because it's easy to say we want to change uh, but there's a lot of issues you have to perhaps convince your bosses or was it the other way around the bosses said to you you have to do this you have to convince the team alongside you your colleagues to to join you on the journey so how was how was the process of trying to uh, think uh, to try and think we want to we want to look at where we want to be in the future without people saying, oh, don't worry about the future, let's just fix the truck that broke down last week or whatever. <laughs> and it's, a, it's a great question. And the, the, the answer is there is no right answer. It's, it's about your organization, and it's about where your organization is going. And the approach that we took was to cross-functionally go ask some questions from all the different functions within the organization about the challenges of today. Secondly, where do they see the market shifting in the future? And with that, that became the priority for us, uh, not to say that the, the current issues weren't, but we needed to focus on the future to prevent being in the same situation as today. And if our overall corporate strategy was going to change, whether it was product offering, geographic distribution, whatever it may be, that takes time to, one, understand, two, develop. And with that, the supply network is very complicated and not something that you can change in, in one to two weeks when you've got 6,000 suppliers. <laughs> so our focus was to understand the challenges, understand the strategy, develop a solution that solved both challenges and in a way that the current challenges being improved funded the investment for the future. And as a result of that, we were able to gain confidence and funding across the organization to not only invest in solving the challenges of today, but solving the challenges that we don't have today because they'll be different in the future. Yes, good point. Um, and for the others, oh, well, for, I guess maybe for all of you, uh, a lot of the uh, possible solutions out there are coming from IT. Uh, so whether it's uh, startups or whether it's established companies, uh, how do you how is the how do you select, choose, buy, partner with IT solutions? Is it uh, do you lead it and bring the IT bring your CIO into the into the discussion? Does the CIO lead it and say, we found some great opportunities and we want you in supply chain to use it? What is the, in this current situation with more and more of logistics being about information and big data, as you said, Balakrishnan? Yeah. Well, how do you, what is the relationship like between the CIO and the, you know, the chief supply chain officer or head of logistics? So maybe Balakrishnan on that. Yeah. I think it's a great question. Um, in, in Ford, and also I see the shift patterns to Chang and Ford, mm -hmm. clearly IT is no more an independent company. IT has to be embedded with the respective skill team, like I say manufacturing or logistics or engineering, so that they clearly understand the requirements and they work closely with the business and offer the solution. That's where we're heading towards. And uh, if, if there is a, a business requirement, picking from the developed IT solution, and I know IT, IT is good in China, a lot mm -hmm. of IT industries are keep emerging in China. So now we are no more copy-paste, 
we really want to see what is a customized solution which fits for the market, which fits for the customer. I think that's where we're heading towards. Mm -hmm. So we need a low cost IT solution to meet our expectations. Okay. Mr. Shu, do you work closely with the IT department at uh, Syke General Motors? Uh, this is my take on this issue. Um, so right now, people are still talking about IT a lot, but there is a new term that has already emerged and that is called DT. So what it means is that in the future, we will transform from IT to DT. Uh, the reason why I brought up this concept is because um, I'm sure that a lot of the participants are from logistic companies. There is no logistic company that dare to claim that they are a DT, a data technology firm. Uh, if one day a logistic company could share with us their vision and say that their vision is to become a logistics DT company, then I think that's the future trend, and I would like to wish them every success. And looking back um, on this topic, so um, from the perspective of SJM, we are still an IT system, I'm afraid to say, not yet a DT system. And IT system is very complicated and very advanced. Um, that's my own personal take. Um, we have also compared ourselves with a lot of other peers. We have also developed a lot of our own systems. Among all the other OEMs, I think we have invested a lot and also we are also ahead of the rest of the industry. Uh, all of these systems you can't simply buy off shelf on the market. Uh, and they don't even have um, prototypes. You have to develop on your own. Um, we may use um, SAP technology, but also on top of that, we do a lot of our own development. And the development is done, uh, is led by the business unit um, because we have some idea and we communicate our idea to this IT firm and they help us. Um, Greg said he has 6,000 suppliers. We also have a lot of suppliers we need to manage. If every single one of us um, talks with one supplier, um, I think it's very difficult to achieve because we definitely need the help of IT system to help us manage all of these vendors. Because computers, as you know, are very powerful in their processing capability. So I think IT as well as DT in the future, um, they need to understand business and they need to be able to work closely with business in order to develop good software that the market needs. Thank you. Greg, how did you, you know, work with your IT team, your CIO, to to get because it was uh, again very much an information based uh, in, uh, development. So. I can remember at the beginning of our transformation, a lot of the activity was reactive. Mm -hmm. We need this, we need this, someone mm -hmm. else has that. And we, we worked our way through that to a point of where do we want to be in the future? Again, what is different? And then enable the IT team to have time to go investigate, to go find, to go make the decision that we need to develop internally ourselves. And, and I fully agree that the future is more of the, the digital transformation of how are you able to more effectively and efficiently use the data, um, either available or go out and find to help drive your business in terms of speed. And in some cases, that means going out and finding partners that have that ability. In other cases, it's developing it yourself where you may be able to have a competitive advantage in the marketplace that may take a little higher initial investment, but if you can protect that IP and you can leverage that in the marketplace and deliver increased value to your organization through performance and cost, then the investment is worth it. Um, but I don't think there is any one right answer other than it needs to be forward-looking because if you're constantly reacting, you're never gonna be ahead. And if you're never gonna be ahead, how are you gonna create value? Mm -hmm. And Mr. Ma, uh, as Kala, are you, I mean, one of the issues seems to be is if everybody, we agree that there needs to be the, these systems, information, connectivity, data technology, but just on this platform, there are three vehicle makers who probably between them have 20,000 suppliers. Uh, how can, can Kala help 
to find some kind of way that they can all communicate or standardization in communication. Otherwise, there is the, the waste of investment with everybody almost developing the same system but making it suit their own organization. And then if you are a big global supplier, you're probably supplying all three of them and having to work with different systems. Can, is, is that your findings, Mr. Ma? And can somebody like Kala help to bring some of these things together? So, my take on this is that if this is the future trend, then I'm sure that it will be some business consideration behind and will be leading to some business outcomes. Um, every company that has the ability to survive in the business world definitely is competitive in somewhere. And if they want to acquire this competitiveness, they definitely have to have some technological means. And the suppliers at upstream and the downstream definitely will have some standards regarding how they connect with each other. And there will definitely be um, the need to connect um, with each other um, in terms of product protocol or in terms of how to connect the data um, so that the companies can reduce their costs and also um, improve their competitiveness to get more profit. Um, that's a very natural business logic, just as uh, Greg said, company strategy is always um, about, uh, so for a company to grow, the company always have to make strategy. And from my perspective as an association, what we need to do is to take a look at the leading companies and most companies in the industry, what they need in order to grow in the future and to use our association as a platform so that different companies can tr sit together. It's not about who is inviting whom, but uh, we sit together for our common interests in China industry association was organized by the government, but in the Western world, it's often set up um, by the companies, although we are government-led, but we're always thinking um, about the interest of the industry, how we can promote the industry's interests, and um, that's what we do um, to make sure that we do, do a good job in setting up the standards so that we can bring these different companies together and they can have their business demand fulfilled. Uh, but we also said that you can't just buy some of these things off the shelf. So how do you expect to find the best solutions out there? Are, you know, there's some great startups now uh, that we want to make that might have fantastic solutions. I think I've said in the past that if, if Uber went to, uh, or Didi went to a big taxi company and said, I have a great solution, they would have said, no, we don't want it. If Airbnb had gone to Marriott and said, I have a great idea, Marriott would have said, no, we don't need it. So how do we make sure we don't miss out on the best uh, new technology that might be startups? Even if they're big companies that have new technology, how do we make sure we don't miss them? And then who should be doing that for you? Should you be looking, you, in a way, you are the guys who have the pain point. You're the ones who need the solution in our particular industry. Is it for you to look for them? Is it for your CIO and IT team to come to you and say, we found some great ideas out in the market? Or is it for the logistics service providers to come to you and say, we've got some great ideas that we can bring to you? Where should the new ideas come from? Uh, and again, I'll start on Balakrishnan, Balakrishnan on yeah. that one. Yeah. yeah. Um, I see it is more like an innovation on mm. everything what we do. Yes. Right. So the the initiative should start from from us from from in this case safe and me, right, and and start giving that idea. And also we should have an extremely listening and participating uh, capabilities with with the partners with with the supplier with the logistic service providers, and and then come together discuss and develop the solution. I think then we can share the solution to the company um, 
to devise as a strategy for going forward. Mm -hmm. But somewhere it should start. I think I believe, in my point of view, I believe uh, the person who does the work has got a more knowledgeable on that work. So he or she can provide good solution and the innovation. And I think that's the start point for every strategy. And we can start combining that and then go it, take it up uh, for the right thing to do. I think so this kind of conferences, I know it's an automotive logistics conference, but like across the industry, as Mr. Ma said, but even the food processing industry, like when we are trying to get some coal supply chain, like we are getting batteries, we need some climatic conditions, et cetera, et cetera. Nothing wrong in learning the whole stuff from how other industries is also doing in terms of the logistics. As I said, it's, a, it's broad. We restrict ourselves, it's only for automotive. Then we are kind of compounding ourselves. So it has to be open. Mm -hmm. That's my view. Okay. Mr. Shu? Uh, so um, this is exactly why I'm here participating in this conference today. Um, so I think Lewis and also Mr. Ma often gave us a very good platform for us to learn from each other. And I still remember in March in Heiko this year, Mr. Ma invited um, some technology firms from logistic companies. Um, mostly it's um, logistic service providers in the fast moving consumer good industry because this industry is growing quite fast and, and they have a lot of clients. Um, I'm sure that every one of us sitting here are clients of these fast-moving consumer good um, service prov providers. We have all used JD or Tmall, but we don't have that many clients as um, like automotive logistic industry. We have a lot of vendors, though. So we need to learn because, like Louis mentioned, we don't. Re there is no technology available that we can just use, we can just buy off the shelf. So we are constantly learning from other industries. We learn their model and then um, we talk to our IT department or we find some IT firms. Um, we investigate together um, and we think about how we can implement the ideas we have. I think that the IT industry should focus on uh, some algorithm in the logistics industry. Because right now we feel that we have hit a bottleneck in the growth of this industry. Is there something that we need to improve? Actually, as of now, I think it's very difficult to improve any further given the current technology. I think the only breakthrough that can come from is algorithm. So, uh, someone comes to me and say he also has AlphaGo, uh, but it's AlphaGo in the logistic industry that can help me manage um, the supplying suppl the 6,000 suppliers. Um, and he can uh, tell me what is the most cost effective way to uh, make the delivery. But unfortunately, there's no such technology available. Greg? So I think, first of all, the, the question has to be to your organizations are we willing to take risk? Right, because nothing really changes in a big way without some level of risk. And a, a few years back, I spent some time in the Silicon Valley talking with the people at Apple and Microsoft and, and some of these companies. There was also some international automotive companies there. It was a, a forum we had at Stanford University. And the one common element that we found from those companies that were perceived to be innovative was a willingness to take some level of risk. <laughs> and that risk may be within your organization, it could be shared within partnerships that you may have, it could even be with risk that a, a service provider that doesn't even engage with you takes. But it first comes with understanding your current challenges, but also your future challenges and solving the problems that you don't have, or that you don't know you have in some cases. And this, this type of thing in, in some companies and some cultures may be viewed as you, know, you want to avoid risk at all cost. But if you ask yourself the question, if you wait for someone else to develop it, will you ever have a competitive advantage? 
or you constantly be reacting. And for Agco, it was a, a shift, right? We want to take a little bit of risk, and let's take some and get some success. But with that, no one's perfect. We, we have taken some, some risks that have not been successful. But in the larger picture, we're much further ahead than we would have been if we would not have taken any risk and waited for someone else to develop that. But those risks have been shared, and those risks have come from being open and transparent with our partners, a couple of which are sitting in the audience. right? And with that, what we have been able to develop has been far ahead of what many others have even thought about. But that comes with some risk mm -hmm. and investment. Mm -hmm. And all I can recommend to you and your teams is to take some portion of your operating expense and have those people focus on tomorrow, next year, five years from now. And how will the organization or the, the customer base or whatever it is that you're operating within change? And many of you think, think back 20 years ago, how we communicated. And now the power that we have within one of these. Think 20 years from now how that's going to be different. And the speed of change. And do you want to be one that's leading that or chasing that? Then you have to answer the question about risk. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Ma, is there, do you think there is a culture in automotive logistics, whether it's at the car makers or the part suppliers or the logistics companies, do you think they are, uh, they, they do, that they are ready to take risks, or do you think they are too careful? I think um, currently the, the leading company that I have encountered are, or first of all, whether uh, they are being prudent or risk taking are uh, all the are all behaviors uh, we see after they've made a decision when they made a decision when they set a direction they especially in in china with the rapid development they will make greater strides instead of being step by step so maybe they will be prudent in holding the lifeline of their operation or their business. But when in terms of innovation, they are more daring. So on the whole, we are seeing all of the players have become more daring. The Chinese automakers have also um, been developing very fast in the, f in, in the past years. The decision-making teams are willing to take the risk to make progress in the future, but the backbone is their decision or their perspective for the future and how the companies can adapt to it. So only with this, such an um, understanding can they be confident. Just to start a, a little bit of trouble, and I hope I don't get you into trouble, but these are kind of to the two JV, JV companies. Is it more complicated when you have a partner uh, to take risk? Because then it, it's bad enough that you have to ask one direction. Um, and you know, you have, in any organization, you have you know, some people who are positive and some people who are negative. But then you double that by having, uh, by having a JV. So to Mr. Shu and Mr. Balakrishnan, is there uh, less opportunity to take risk uh, when you are in a, a joint venture? I think, uh, <clears throat> let me go first. So mm -hmm. in my last four or five months observation, um, the answer I can say, it is yes. And, uh, but it really, helps if you explain the way the partner understands, or the both partner understands. So for example, if you want to have electric vehicle, and I know in China it is 
more driven um, uh, uh, policy and try to get more and more new energy vehicles. So for doing that, we need all the infrastructure and all the requirements. So how to go about? Now it is at top level it has been taken decision, but in terms of choosing the right partner, um, who to take, because it's new. Because new means always the kind of confidence, how to build confidence between the partners. I think that's a clear opportunity. Because I didn't see that in, in Ford, in my previous role, where a lot of experimentation was taken, um, be it connected vehicles, be it electric vehicles, self-driven vehicles and all those. But when it comes to JV, it obviously takes time. But once we agree, the execution is uh, quite rapid, I can say. Because mm -hmm. the agreement is something, a confidence building, and then it needs a lot of time and energy, and then move forward. Mm -hmm. That's my view. <coughs> Mr. Shu. Louis, to us, especially Trump, Trump has already, already waging the trade war flag against us. It's a quite sensitive question. If you look at the over 20 years of collaboration of SAIC, Jimmy and GM, so far so good. But when the trade war really starts, um, you know, anyway, five years later, the protection will be lifted. So what will happen, we will see. Okay. Uh, I just, uh, it's a, it's a Q&A, or if there's any questions or, or comments from, from the stage, don't be shy. Please, you know, raise your hands and, and ask us any of the questions. I still have some more questions here. So you will not go home earlier <laughs> if you don't ask any questions. So. <laughs> A question from the young man. Hi, this is uh, Alan Boyd from Unipart Logistics. Um, I've heard some very interesting comments about, um, about technology, uh, about some of the difference between, between IT and how we integrate that into our operations. Um, I'd like to almost stick a HR hat on now and say, what about the skills in the market? Do, do we have the skills in the market in order to, to, to build this into our future operations? And if there is a skills gap, what, what are you doing as companies to attract those people to, to come and work for you? That's a very good question and a global question. At most of our conferences, uh, there is this discussion about the next generation of people we're, we want the automotive industry to be high-tech, high-quality, uh, a sexy industry, but most of the young people, they still want to work for Apple or JD.com or Huawei and so on. How do we make sure we generate the right people to manage, to be the, the, the panel for this conference in five or ten years' time? I'll, I'll take that one. Um, at least initially. We, we recognized this maybe um, six years ago, that we had a challenge to have enough incoming talent to support the innovative tools and processes that we're implementing across the globe. And with that, we started a pilot program in, um, in Michigan, in the US, somewhat automotive-centric type of place. And we were able to work with a local university, um, Western Michigan University, who today has one of the top 10 ISM programs in the world. And with that, we are generating talent that has three different SAP courses and packaging engineering and all of these things that we, at the time, we said we needed. And we've since that uh, program success have rolled that out into South America and into Europe with a number of universities in uh, Germany and Hungary and France. And what we found is as we're working with the students that are in their second and third year is an interest to join organizations that were viewed as innovative, that are, that are you know, speaking at these type of events, because they view that that is a good opportunity for them long term. And with the millennials today, 
Uh, it's very much about where am I going to be in two and three and five years so that my life will be fun <laughs> and enjoyable. <laughs> so uh, again, it comes, with, it comes with an understanding where your organization is going, what those needs are going to be, and are the talent levels that you have at the level today and have not putting together a strategy that will solve that for the, for the future. But excellent question. Yeah, let me just, because I'm, I will just, in this question I will take, not China specific, I will take maybe an India specific. Mm -hmm. um, education requires a radical change to meet the future expectations of industry. The education system, uh, what being followed, and whether is it suitable, that requires a big change. In fact, a couple of universities uh, we have, in fact, my own interest, uh, the universities kind of approached me and tried to set the syllabus for people who are doing working in industry and they want to do some kind of uh, studies, more work-oriented studies. So it means in their career, almost one to two years, they're going to study more to learn what industry wants. So which is, in my view, it's, it, then it requires a basic system of education needs a change. Um, so talent building, expectations, and clearly having industry come university joint workshops and bringing them, though there are internships, though there are people who comes for project work, for just for a couple of months, they really don't absorb unless the core education syllabus undergoes a change. So, so I think that's a big area. And in India, we see less than 35 years of our um, population, I mean age, contribute 65 percent of the population. That's a bigger workforce coming up. I think I see that's a big opportunity in front especially considering India. And India is a good example. I was talking to a global car maker recently who was trying to get a new project going. Or not even a project. He wanted to learn about a new technology. And he said he was trying to work with different departments, his own department, his own region, and so on. The only way he got it looked at is he turned to his IT team in India because mm. they were more hungry and eager I think they even did it out of office hours because they also wanted to learn yeah. uh, about the new technology. So it's interesting that even from uh, the US it was, he turned to India to get the kind of the work done. Right. But Mr. Shu, again, the, the same question about the, the next Mr. Shu. <laughs> uh, um, it's great you answered this, uh, asked this question. I'll uh, talk about my personal experience. After I graduated from high school, my math teacher approached me saying whether I want to directly get me enrolled into the uh, um, mathematic department of a um, uh, course of a university. I rejected that. So I, now I'm in the automotive industry. Now. I actually uh, encouraged my son to join the math competition. And I want him to go to the math, uh, a very good math course in the university. However, actually, my example has answered to, uh, provide answer to the gentleman's question. Education is a social issue. It's not something that we can, that can be covered in our conference. You know, um, AI or algorithm makes the mathematical department very hard, mathematics de subject very hard, very popular. So the aspiring students really want to uh, go to the mathematics department. At my age, no one wanted to go to mathematics uh, department. So time has changed, and it shows the di direction of development in the society. So that's what I said, the DTL or AI at that time, uh, AI is the future. So going back to my company, you know, uh, our main operation, our main business is to build vehicle. It will not 
directly research on the IT issues or the data matters. As long as we have a good model to find market uh, partners in the market, to so ask them to design for us and co-develop with us. For example, whether you can develop the AlphaGo of uh, logistics, then it's fine. Uh, whether you are Google or Baidu or Microsoft or even Tencent, doesn't matter whether it's an IT company in the logistic industry, as long as your solution fits my requirement. Regarding talents, I also like to um, talk about it. Um, I think the talents we're talking about is definitely not someone as uh, a small, maybe a small member in the assembly line. The talent we're talking about should have the responsibility to uh, forge the future for the company to make it a very competitive or a leader in the industry. I think education is not the most critical part of cultivating talents. Of course, it's very important. Uh, one, uh, interest is very important. Second is uh, education. And the, the most important one, the third one, is uh, practice. I think a fourth one is aspiration or passion. If you can see that the leading companies in China, the core or the leading technical expertise are, are meeting the first three requirement, practice, education, and um, interest. And then, based on that, they want to be outstanding. So they look for a platform, they go to the platform to realize their dreams. However, if we look at most of the industries, they put technology and operation side by side and treat them as the same thing. But if you look at the Chinese economy, you can see two major groups of companies. Whether you are food, pro uh, whether you're re real uh, entity, or you are an IT company, or you're a real entity manufacturing companies, but the birth of IT company is to solve some issues that happens in the real economy. For example, Baidu, Tencent, other IT companies. The inception of these companies is is aimed at solving some social issues or technical issues. Because uh, technology is in at their DNA, that's why we call them IT companies. But for us, uh, we also need such a DNA in tech of technology in our automotive logistics so that if the com if the talents in the companies know that they also have opportunities in automotive logistics, they will come. For example, uh, one of the hardest companies uh, making a digital platform is G7. This is a company or a platform that uh, is building a a, pla a a common platform for track for trucks and vans. Actually, the CEO of the company came from Tencent. He knew that this logistic, logistic field can help him to uh, become a much more successful person than just an IT or technical personnel. A question from there first in the middle. And if you can say your name and the company, please. Thank you. Internet of Things related. I have two questions. One is an open question. The next question is to Mr. Xu. So my first question is, um, so as a consumer, we have been talking about customizing cars for a very long time. 
actually, compared with Japan, China is、uh, quite behind in this area, and I think it's probably because before 2017,、um, the China's automotive market was growing so rapidly. So OEMs don't really care what customers need because customers simply buy what they offer. In 2017. Uh, if we deduct、um, tax subsidies and also if we deduct、um, inflation, actually the growth has already turned negative. So I'm sure that 2018 and 2019 will be a tough period. So that means、uh, car customization will be a key topic. Is our supply chain ready、um, for the production cycle? Is is it ready for? Vehicle customization. Do we have any plan in this area? That's the first question to all of the panelists. And the second question、um, is that a lot of the supply chain is prepared for a traditional fuel-burning vehicle. In the next generation, cars、um, are equipped with new technology, and the parts. The amount of parts used will be 30% to 50% less for new types of vehicles, and that will pose different requirements for IT technology as well as for the supply chain. As Mr. Xu mentioned, SGM has、um, had a lot of new technology、um, under development. So I'm interested in what you think. So first of all, please allow me to answer your first question.、Um, first of all,、um, for SGM. We don't really have the capability now for complete customization because、uh, a very important premise for customization is that you have clients for customization, and we customize based on the client's demand. Also, we're saying that we are producing for clients, but actually we're producing、uh, for inventory.、Uh, we first build the car, and then customer come in to pick to buy. I'm sure that you all know. Do you want to wait for three weeks for a car? Nobody will say yes.、Um, everybody will go to buy another brand if they're asked to wait. So I have to build up my inventory first, and then customers come in and buy. So if I prepare inventory first,、uh, there's no way for me to customize the car. And as I've mentioned, customers don't want to wait for three weeks. So the so-called customization is basically non-existent. It isn't 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 valid. Customization is only possible when customers are willing to wait at least for three weeks, and nobody wants to do that now, because the market in China is very competitive. They can simply go next door, and if they are not happy with the next door's offering, they can simply go down the street, and there are more. Of course, technology-wise, we don't have the technology needed to support customization, because customization means、um, that the specifications you need to offer, the parts you need to offer, have the number has has grown exponentially. So, I will have to be able to be very accurate in forecasting the part. So it is very difficult to manage the supply chain now. When we don't offer customized cars, we already see a lot of waste coming from the supply chain because the demand is changing very fast already. I'm very, I really look forward to having an AlphaGo in supply chain that can help me calculate、uh, the demand that I have now. If such a technology really becomes available, I think that would be a better time to talk about the prospect of customization. Otherwise, customization is only、um, just empty talking. Like I mentioned, we need to prepare the inventory first before we can sell to customers. Customization first. We'll go to the panel, and then we'll go back on the、uh, the new generation of vehicles. So,、uh, Agco, how many of your your products are customized in some way? Customized is a, a very wide range、yeah. when you when you talk about the term. We we、mm. do have a few of our brands where we will, you know, say paint different colors or add different configuration offerings at a customer's ex expectation. The time for sure is less, or sorry, more, but the customer is typically willing to wait for that to have that specialty. And and with that, the customer value in an Agco brand to take on the complexity that they, as a customer, are willing to pay for, is one of the reasons why they come to Agco. Because we have went 
and found a way to manage that complexity because that's what differentiates us in the marketplace. Now, other products that we have are very similar to what we heard from the automotive side. The customer wants the product to drive it off the lot or to have it in a, in a day or, or a couple days. For that particular market, we also are building to order, but we do have the ability to do some level of what we call postponement, which would mean after we have 90% of the vehicle available, we can either through aftermarket at the dealer or at one of our distribution sites, customize some options for the customer but it doesn't come without some level of uh, innov innovative way of managing that. Mm -hmm. Now, there's another uh, several brands that we have where the customer may be willing to pay or wait two, three months, but they're also paying 500,000 euros for a vehicle. Mm -hmm. So they pretty much want it the way they want it. And we have processes in place today that manage that complexity, but very different than the automotive mass production today. Mm -hmm. Krishna? Yeah. I think the point Mr. Shu said uh, is almost the same. What even in Chang and Ford or in Ford, it happens. Customization is a long way, very long way to go in comparing the current automotive mass production process. We are going back. In fact, we are looking where we can reduce the buildable configuration, how to bring down so that we can match the orderable configuration and what buildable. And we follow build to stock strategy, not build to order strategy, like exactly what Mr. Shu said. Um, and in terms of going forward, we clearly see there is a resource. I mean, when you're bringing a new product to the market, you need to tap the engineering potentials. So we need to design, keep the design ready so you can react. Because if you take our new product development lead time, it, it takes from 24 months, depends on the product, what you bring. So this lead time, and you bring the product, by the time you launch, the time to market, you already have a market has changed. That the two years or 18 months period, what we talk, the market has changed. So it is important that we need to tap, keep the engineering resources and the resource planning. I think that's where the clear, balanced way how to bring down the configuration. So customization is very, very long way from automotive side, at least, I can say. Okay. Thank you. And the second point was almost the opposite, in a way. If we're looking at the next generation of, um, of engines or, or whatever they're going to be called, we said there's actually, we expect to be so many less parts. So at this mo and if you look at you know, the next generation of buyers, uh, they're the buyers who are used to Apple iPhones and things, that perhaps they expect less complexity, they are more going to be sharing the rides and different ways of mobility, so maybe you don't need to personalize it. So on the one hand, you are preparing your supply chains now for the future, and we're talking about how do we help, the, how do we change to support them because they're so complex. But in reality, is the supply chain of the future going to be much, much simpler because there is less customization uh, and, and even less parts? Balakrishna. Yeah. I, I think I fully agree because the future business trend is more ride sharing and ride hailing mm -hmm. uh, rather than the owning the vehicle. So if that's where we are all heading towards, then with the energy, I mean the electric vehicle, the new energy vehicle bringing into the market, obviously it needs less parts, less complexity, it gives more space, bring a lot of innovation in the product design. And the future business, and if everyone wants to share, no one wants to own, <laughs> things are different. I mean the, the demand, how it is going to look like, and even there are congested cities in the world. A lot of experimentation is going on right now in US, in London. A lot of experimentation on how to use the apps for ride sharing and ride hailing technology. So already the, the future is moving towards that direction. Mm -hmm. So that's where I see the, the customization takes very long. And because of the business, the thinking shift is changing from the consumer point of view. Mm -hmm. 
And that's my view. Mm. Any other comment? Yeah, Mr. Shu. <coughs> Um, I think we all know that an increasing number of vehicles are electric vehicles. Um, of course, um, they are still being developed, and also we've got autonomous driving on the radar. In the future, maybe we don't call cars cars, maybe they are mobility tools. So that means the functions they serve will be changed. A lot of the things that we fit on the car today may be different from the cars in the future. Maybe in the future, there will be more new parts in the car in the future. So we don't need to think about the complexity of, compl uh, we do need to think about complexity of manufacturing declining. Um, I think one other thing we can think about is how we can combine automotive logistics with other types of logistics. We're still delivery. Uh, right, um, it's the same to deliver parts as well as it's the same to deliver food and other packages. So, from a big picture perspective, um, I think that's a more fun topic to explore. The automotive industry, this future state, is going to become quite challenging because as you have platforms across the globe, you also will have different levels of regional or network abilities to support those autonomous driving. And if you understand what autonomous driving is, it's much more than just the vehicle itself. It's the complete network at a city level, at a state level, province level, et cetera, but also then the interconnectivity. And when you then compare that to, say, what maybe Africa will have, right, in 20 years compared to some of the developed countries in China, it will be different. So the automotive companies will now have a different level of complexity because you're going to have these very high-end, technically enabled vehicles. Well, at the same time, you're going to have maybe a 20, 30-year-old design that's still being produced for certain markets of the world. So within that, how will you be able to manage a larger amount of supply network complexity than what you have today? And that's what you need to start thinking about today for tomorrow mm -hmm. because it's coming. Mr. Ma, anything to... Uh. Um, actually, I really agree with what Mr. Xu uh, mentioned, Mr. Xu's answer to your question. Um, from the perspective of an industry association, we're also um, trying to see what the future focus or priority will be for the industry. Of course, we um, highly the industry is highly fragmented. Um, we divide it into automotive logistics, clothing logistics, food logistics. But at the same time, we see the logistics industries being integrated and coming together. Um, for example, um, NG Logistics has also set up um, a separate company that manages not just logistics delivery, but of course, all of these capabilities are based on their old capabilities of transporting automotive parts. Um, now, um, in addition to their four business units, they have one more. So it's difficult to say for sure what logistic companies will look like. Maybe they start as an automotive logistic company, but in the future, um, their business may be more than that. So as an industry association, we're also thinking about uh, how we should better serve the industry employers. Uh, in the first 10 years, we have gathered together um, OEMs or manufacturers around logistics services. Maybe in the future, uh, we will serve this logist. Uh, we will serve manufacturers even more. Because um, automotive is in their genes, and like Mr. Xu mentioned, maybe in the future they're not called car anymore. Maybe they will be called mobility tool. But regardless, they're still vehicle. Um, I think logistic for a finished vehicle is different because they are um, special. Um, logistic company still needs to be very professional. Uh, they need specialized knowledge. Um, but for parts, I think uh, we will see more convergence. But in but manufacturing 
still needs to be highly specialized. Um, and that's also going to be our priority when we think about what we should focus on without changing um, our industry's name. And just to add on top of that, because we're running out of time, So based on my observation of many different industries, I think um, that the Chinese market and also China's market for logistics has um, a very bright future ahead. Because the Chinese market presents huge demand. Um, what we need in the logistics industry is technology here in China. So Tainiao, JD, or Suning, these e-commerce players. Uh, this logist e-commerce e logistics providers are being very successful in their own area, and they also are interested in cross into other industries, just like Mr. Ma said, um, Changzhou Logistics and also ING Logistics, and they are the top players in automotive logistics. They're also thinking about going cross to other areas. It's hard to say five to ten years later who are successful in this crossover, who have um, consolidated with whom or who have acquired whom. But one thing I know for sure is that uh, they will definitely be more successful than UPS. There is definitely uh, still a strong automotive logistics industry uh, for the next few years because obviously that, that's my industry. <laughs> um, well, I think that this is a good time to kind of, you know, to end the conversation. Uh, just a couple of things. Firstly, um, you should have the evaluation forms in front of you, so please complete those. Tell us your opinions on the, on the conference, any ideas, what we can do differently. Your, this conference is your conference, so please tell us what you want us to do to make sure you have the best possible uh, event for you. Uh, and in some of the conversations we were hearing uh, just now, it reminded me of a couple of quotes. There is a, an American TV program uh, or there was, and it was about the rocket launch of the Apollo rockets going to the moon and the story of, of doing it. And some of the quotes that came from it made me think uh, it suits our industry at the moment. One of them was, the more knowledge we have, the less we know. Because we're learning so much all the new technology, but it just seems to be confusing us more than ever. And the other thing is, you know, again, we were talking about the iPhones and iPads. If we'd have asked you 10 years ago, what do you think will be the future? I don't know how many would have said, oh, we will do things on the iPhone. So the, the next thing is, uh, one of the things I was saying about developing the rockets is uh, what we are trying to achieve in 10 years' time, the things that we will, that will help us to get there have not even been invented yet. So we're trying to plan for something, but there's probably some 18-year-old kid in a Chinese university or an American garage who's going to solve all our problems and we don't even know about it yet. But uh, firstly, I'd like to, th before I completely finish the conference, I just want to thank the panel for a very, very honest and interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, as I said, I hope you've had a good uh, two days and met some great people, may get some new knowledge, shared some information. Uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors, our premier sponsor, Changzhou Logistics, China Forever Logistics, for being our first premier sponsor and for hosting the great dinner last night. Our gold sponsors, CFR Rinkins, Confezioni, Andrea, FedEx, Kuna and Nagel. Our, uh, our, gold, our global sponsors, CNW and Jeffco. And our silver sponsors, Bellore, DS Smith, Goodpack and Royale. I'd also like to thank our great partners, Kala and CFLP. They really are a great organization. So if you're not members of them, then please, it's really an organization that is really trying to help support uh, our industry. And they have and work very closely with the government. So anything that you want to change or to influence uh, Mr. Ma and his team, uh, Chris or Connie, who helps us a lot, they're a great team to work with. So make sure you build a good contact with, with CFLP. I'd also like to thank our hosts uh, from Chengdu, uh, the Chengdu Export Bureau and the Chengdu Port, uh, for inviting us here to, uh, to, uh, to Chengdu, uh, to this beautiful city, and, uh, and helping us to see and admire what's happened there. 
And one of the things that sometimes uh, we get asked at the conferences, uh, before I do that, I just before the, uh, the evaluation forms, I don't know if anyone has, if you have completed your evaluation form, if you can let us know, uh, we will collect it. Otherwise, if you want to leave it on your, on your table, then, then please do that. But uh, if you have an evaluation form, uh, please make sure you give it back. You can either raise your hand with it, or you can hand it at the registration desk. Um, and uh, because, we, as I said, we do take them very seriously. Uh, if you want to work with us, uh, uh, or globally, we have conferences, as I've said, all around the world. Uh, it's difficult for me to remember them all, even though I'm such a young man. But I think, where are we now? Uh, April, okay, April is China. May, we have a, a supply chain conference in Atlanta in the USA. June, we have our Europe conference, which is in Germany, in Bonn. Uh, in August, we have a conference on import and exporting finished vehicles in the port of Baltimore in the US. Our uh, original conference, Automotive Logistics Global, will be in Detroit. And I know many of you have, have visited uh, that conference in the past. Our UK conference, which is in London in October. In November, we have our, uh, a new conference on Central and Eastern Europe, which will be in Hungary in November. In December, we have our South America conference, which is, will be in Sao Paulo in Brazil. In January, will be our Mexico conference uh, in Mexico City, a very, you know, a growing market and one which the Chinese are entering very quickly as well. Uh, in March uh, will be our Finnish Vehicle Logistics Conference in North America. And then uh, in April, we hope, uh, our next conference back in, back at Automotive Logistics China, Shanghai uh, for 2019. In the meantime, uh, in November, there will be the, the big CFLP conference as well, which uh, I'm sure CFLP would love to see you all there. Uh, but we, we do have a, a China, our conference in Chengdu is really one of my favorite conferences. And it reminds me of a, a question you see asked sometimes, sometimes in job interviews, uh, sometimes uh, just on quizzes, and they say, what animal would you like to be? If you could choose, what animal would you like to be? And some people say, I want to be a lion because they're so big and strong. And other people want to be a snake because they're smart and intelligent and find ways of, of getting revenge on, on people. Well, I've decided after the great, uh, the great time I've had in Chengdu uh, that what, what kind of animal suits me? What animal is kind of, I don't know, easygoing, likes to eat a lot, uh, maybe not so active and likes to sleep a lot? So I've decided that the animal I would like to be is a panda. So uh, from next year, I would like to change my name to Shongmao uh, Yakumi. So that is what you can call me from now on. But otherwise, I hope you had a, a great two days here in Chengdu. I hope we will see you at the very least in Shanghai in 2019. But thank you very much to everybody, our sponsors, our delegates, uh, the great speakers, uh, the car makers, part suppliers, and the associations who attended. So thank you very much, everybody, and we look forward to seeing you again somewhere soon. Thank you. See you soon.